Hey, it's Cosmo Solutions 8, and in this video, I want to talk to you about some of the changes that Google made to the lead form extension, which is my new favorite extension. Um, this isn't the ultimate guide to using the lead form extension. I've actually already shot that video, so I'm going to just link to that in the description of this one. If you want to get brushed all the way up, then go watch that video, but if you're just interested in some of the updates, this is where you need to be. You did it. Well done. I'm proud of you. Let's do this. Um, so when you open up that extension, I'm going to assume that you know what lead form extensions are now since I made that preface. Um, when you open up the lead form extension, it looks pretty familiar, but they've made, made some changes. The first, and I think maybe the most important change is the preview. Um, so we, we can toggle back and forth between mobile and desktop, but most importantly, um, we can toggle between search, YouTube, and Gmail. This wasn't available to us before, uh, and it's Wicked Ninja Awesome, um, just to be able to see uh, you know, what it's going to look like implemented. And I think it's actually really cool that we can start to, pardon me, uh, expand this extension into um, different facets of the Google ecosystem. So really cool preview setting. Um, I'm going to pause that so it doesn't distract the daylights out of me. Um, this is all rote and routine. One of the things they added in the questions, though, is they gave you the opportunity to see which form fields are actually going to be pre-filled. This is really important because it wasn't clear prior to. So if you're not aware, Google has um, it has contact information cached on people. And if somebody opens up a lead form extension, this is a form that opens inside of the Google ecosystem. So if you're in Google search and you click on a lead form extension, it will actually open up right there in your mobile browser, which is kind of nifty. Um, and if it has the information we're asking for, it will pre-populate those fields. This is good and bad. Um, it's it's good because it, it makes the barrier to entry far lower. It's just so much easier for somebody to convert. It's bad because it's so much easier for somebody to convert. And so you end up getting some irrelevant leads. Just, you know, it, it, people are able to convert at a speed that's a little bit faster than, um, than they're able to necessarily discern whether or not this is the right decision for them. So we ran this for ourselves. Uh, my average cost per lead in the Google Ads ecosystem is $225. Uh, our average cost per lead using lead forms inside of YouTube ads was 20 bucks. It was amazing. But the leads were very diluted from a quality standpoint. And I think a lot of that had to do with just the speed at which people can, can take you up on your offer. Um, so the, the, the pre-filled forms are, are great, but know that there's a double edge to that sword. Um, and there's ways around that, adding custom questions, for example, just to you know stop people in their tracks and um, pre-qualify them could be really helpful. So I, I really like that it lets you know which of these form fields is, is pre-filled. The other thing that was cool for me, and maybe I should have intuited this, but I was always curious whether or not uh, email and work email would both be pre-filled or if it would just be email. And it looks like it's just email. Um, so I, I think it's, it's good for us to know um, you know, that information. It's nice that Google's making that available. Uh, I looked through the questions. It doesn't look like there's been any expansion to the questions, at least not to the categories. I didn't go comprehensively through every single one of these. Um, but, you know, I like checked auto in general. Um, and the questions, if you haven't played with them, are really worth doing. I talk about that in the other video, so I'll leave it alone here. But they get, they get, I mean, really customized, uh, surprisingly so. Um, so I strongly recommend using the more questions. I realize you're going to get less leads, you're going to get more valuable leads. Um, and it'll help you qualify. Uh, background image, same as always. They've revamped where things are found. So your call to action used to be at the top, now it's at the bottom. Um, here's our form submission message, which is just your thank you message with your, with your CTA. Um, but what's cool is they've actually expanded for the ads, they've expanded the number of CTAs. So not all of these were here prior to. We've gotten uh, uh, quite a few more. Um, so, you know, if you were a little CTA sparse prior to, just know that you have, uh, you have more opportunities to, to draw from. Um, the thing that I think is the coolest there is uh, lead delivery option uh, was already here. And we're, you know, obviously we can download it if we want to. We definitely want to use the webhook. I love that Google's now pimping out Zapier. I think that's great. Um, that actually kind of surprises me, to be honest with you. I was sort of, I was shocked when I saw this, but Google's sitting here letting you know how to use Zapier in order to integrate with Google's lead form extensions. Um, Google, historically, in my experience, has not been super Zap Zapier friendly. Uh, some people call it, say Zapier, by the way, but that doesn't make sense to me because it's a Zap. So it's clearly Zapier, just to put a nail in that coffin. That's a clear. Uh, it's an axiom. Um, so I think it's cool that Google's showing people how to use Zapier. This is really easy, by the way. Don't let yourself be intimidated by this. Um, here, here's what I think is uh, the most important piece of the update. It's the easiest setting, but it's also, it wasn't available to us prior to. In lead form type, it's asking, um, Optimize for leads with higher intent or for more leads overall. Audiences won't be added or removed and the fields in your lead form won't be changed. 
Now, Google is recommending that we optimize for higher intent. I'm actually inclined to say that if I were a betting man, I would bet that this ends up working in our favor because my experience with Google's new segmentation with some of their custom audiences is Google has actually gotten really good at uh, identifying and predicting intent. Um, scary good. Uh, so much so that I'm, I'm, I'm worried uh, for humanity. Um, so I would say it's, it's, you know, this ends up being a, a pretty safe default, even though I know you always hear me talk about how the recommended tab usually means you're going to be taken advantage of. Um, that, that doesn't mean that we want to be petulant children. I, I do think given Google's prowess with this particular piece of functionality, I would assume that optimizing for higher intent um, is a good call. However, test everything always. That's how we get good at this. That's how we learn all the stuff that we learn um, is we just we play around with it. So I'd run a cam one campaign with higher intent, one campaign with more volume, um, and, and you know split those right down the middle and start to see which one works better for you. My expectation is there are going to be some industries that you know uh, uh, are best aligned with with both. So you know if you're in the automotive space, for instance, everybody needs a car. So the higher intent might not be quite as important. Maybe you want to go more vo more volume, um, you know, quantity over quality. Or you know maybe we find out that the more volume is diluted, but it's not diluted enough to justify the decrease in the leads that you receive or the increase in the price that you receive. Because you know realize asking for higher intent, this is going to impact the entire algorithm. Um, and so, you know, uh, what, what you pay and where you rank, those types of things are ultimately going to be impacted, I would assume, um, because you're, you're changing your relevance in a way. Um, you know, the number of people that are, that are opting in, uh, for instance. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too committed to one option or the other. I haven't tested this enough to give you, um, obviously it's brand new, but so I haven't tested this enough to give you my strong recommendation one way or the other. I'd ask that uh, for now, you test it, and um, we'll you know do the same thing on our end. With you know, as soon as I have a, a clear view with enough clients, then you know maybe I'll loop back around and tell you which of these settings I think is um, better from a data-driven perspective. But right now, knowing nothing, I would say I'd opt in for the higher intent. Um, and I think it's it's pretty interesting that Google is. I mean, they're pushing this, you know, uh, account wide, Google Ads wide. Um, they're really leaning into their machine learning, and there's it's no wonder it's working. It's working, and it's working well. Um, which is, you know, <laughs> uh, it's interesting to see, um, and, and it will continue to be interesting to see how Google chooses to use this because uh, they're positioned to begin really gerrymandering traffic. Gerrymandering, however that word is said. Um, and I don't know the right way around that. I mean, obviously, there's an antitrust suit right now going up against Google, and so I imagine this is one of the things that will be brought up. But if Google knows exactly what a customer is worth to you and exactly how much you're willing to spend, and it knows that about all your competitors, and it knows who converts at what rate, and it knows how much traffic is available, how could it not begin price setting? You know, price fixing the auction, basically, um, to, to maximize its own profitability or maximize, you know, at a minimum, maximize the, the available traffic. Um, and so now it, it becomes less about a meritocracy and more about Google's inventory management. And, uh, you know, we'll see. There's, I, it would be really difficult to identify whether or not that's even happening unless you had, you know, basically every client in one industry under, under one agency. And some agencies do. You know, I mean, there's some agencies out there that are niched down and um, they would actually have that data accessible to them. So I'll be watching them. We're not one of those agencies. We've got, you know, over 100 clients and 90 different industries or whatever it is. Um, and, and I like that, you know, there's a value proposition to that too, incidentally. Um, the niche down agencies, of course, they learn more about that industry than we do. And, and I'd be an idiot to try to argue that point. We learn more about Google Ads though. So the niche down industries, or the niche down agencies are gonna know more about an industry, for sure. But we're gonna know way more about Google Ads. You know, it's a breadth and depth discussion. And my argument is, you the client already know about your industry. You don't know about Google Ads. Um, and so I, I, I like being diversified because it, it gives us the opportunity to, to you know, I mean, there, there are strategies and tactics in industry A that if you carry over to industry B, um, really make a massive difference. And if you're niched down, you just never have the opportunity to even try that. So uh, maybe I'll make a video next about um, should you work with a niche agency, niche or niche, I don't know how it's said. I hope you liked this video. Thumbs up if it was good. Comments if you have questions. Subscribe if you want to see me uh, go every day. And uh, hopefully someday I'll start to post live. Until then, I will see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.